Hello, very highly regarded sound of vinyl enthusiast. I'm about to interview the very great Lisa Fancher, my pal and sonic ally for many, many years. Some of the first punk rock records I bought, she put out, and we're gonna get into it right now. Lisa, I wanna to talk to you about the fact that you are a record label owner, but quite obviously a music fan. And quite often, the person who owns the, the independent record label, you know, they got into it because they love music. But you've been doing it for so long. And in just my opinion, your taste in music is so unassailably good. I, I, I mean, I some of the first records, punk like punk rock long players I got, you know, Adolescence, Circle Jerks. So you're like, you've been in my record collection like years before I ever met you. And, and so, what made you want to go from fan to the, 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 the risk of owning a record label? Well, I, was, uh, I worked in record stores and I wrote for various local, I had my own fanzines and I wrote for the Herald Examiner, but just writing about music isn't enough. So one of the people I worked for was Greg Shaw and I would play him the stuff and I'd, and I'd be like, what about the Flyboys? I really like them. I was thinking of putting out a record and he'd just roll his eyes and be like, ugh, they're awful. Or, you know, <laughs> something along those lines. So I didn't betray Greg Shaw. I, I, you know, I learned the ropes from him, but then I just decided that it would be a lot better to demonstrate how great LA was by actually putting out the records and using my own money. And the good thing about working at Bomp is I didn't get paid very often. They'd pay you like every six weeks or every two months. Right. So I just take somebody in the studio or in the Circle Jerks case, like I just bought the record from them. You know, it was, everything was different. So uh, you said Greg Shaw, and, and you just said Bomp Records. Mm -hmm. uh, great label. Yes. Uh, and Greg Shaw, a real mover. I mean, he, he really uh, made a lot of records happen and changed a lot of people's minds. I, I, I don't think he gets en uh, enough mention. Uh, absolutely does not get enough credit. Yeah. A lot of people don't know who he is. But he was a great mentor to me, and he always was. I Actually, I would try to sell him records, or I would buy stuff off his mail order list, and then right. I would be like, I'm a better writer than anybody on Bomp, so... He let me write about, you know, a couple of Fally bands like the Hollywood Stars. I wrote right. the cover story for the Runaways and things like that. So um, he was always super helpful. For me. And he was always way ahead of his time in terms of everything, mm. whatever. Let's talk about the, the early days of Frontier. Like, where are you running your office out of? Where are you putting your inventory? How are you getting the records out? At the very, very beginning, I still lived with my parents. I couldn't afford to do an apartment have an apartment and put out records. So for the Flyboys and Circle Jerks, I was living at home, you know, but that was only 1980 and then I moved out and had my own apartment. And I kept the stuff in the garage and my neighbors loved me. Let me tell you, trucks coming all the time, picking stuff up and dropping it off. And yeah, it was not a good scenario at all. So I would keep moving around. I had, I moved several times because I just drove people crazy. I was renting a house at one point in Studio City, and it was the same thing. Like, the truck would block the entire street. So it was interesting. And I would actually drive the records around on Friday, like if something was out, like the adolescence. Like, everybody had to have it that second. So right. I'd get my sweet Pinto out and, like, go drive it to, like, uh, Zed. Right. Uh, you know, whatever, Rhino. So those were interesting times. So, um but now I don't have to warehouse the stuff at my house, which is really great. Well, that speaks to the fact that you have distribution. Um, Talk about the challenge of distribution for independent music in the early days of Frontier, because there must there, it it's must. It's no been. different now. I mean, it's seriously. I only had one tiny oasis in the sun. That was when Mordam. I was distributed by Mordam for like not even four years. But before that, I, I wish I'd kept a list of how many people burned me. You know, Gem. You know, people that owed me. You know, six figures. Yeah. You know, I got burned over and over, and then it was just like uh, I got tired of of that game and the treadmill of trying to get paid. So I did three disastrous deals in a row. I did nice people. I was with Ryko Disc for three years, got paid, didn't sell any records at all. They just didn't, I was just in the wrong place. Then I was with BMG for three years and everything was in the stores, but it was all returns. They would just force people to buy tons of records yeah. and they just all came back. So that was, it was an interesting thing to learn how, you know, after me bashing major labels my whole life, it's interesting to find out what that was like. And they were really cool people. It was just the wrong place. And then I licensed the top sellers to Epitaph from, I think it was 93 to 96. And those were in the stores, but, you know, I finally paid all the bands up and got caught up, but I didn't get anything for three years, so. But anyway, then Mordan picked us up, and it was great. We got paid, and then not much time after that, Ruth decided she'd had enough and was going to quit, so. All right. And then it was like I got stiffed over and over again. Now I co-own my distributor. I started a distributor with a label called uh, Beer City, 
and we have a, a warehouse in Milwaukee. So um, unless I develop some kind of weird drug habit, or he does, like we're you know I'm gonna get paid every month, and it's really great. Oh, so cool. we've been the most stable like ever. So what was it like putting out two immediately classic records? First adolescence album and group sex. I mean, I love those records, and group sex is kind of a miracle. How did that record do for you when you put it out? Uh, Everyone I know had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first I wanted to say The Flyboys is the first record I put out, and that was okay. a total failure. Like, they broke up before the record came out, oh. and it was dead in the water. Circle Jerks, luckily for me, they had worked with Robbie Fields, and they were like, no way we're making a record for Robbie Fields. Hell no. So um, I just, you know, called Lucky on the phone, made a deal. He actually did say to me, um, no girl's going to put out my record. And then he, he, yeah, he talked to a few people in Hollywood and anyway, it was fine. We smoothed it all over, but uh, it did really well. Like it did well from the get go. So then when you have something that's selling that everybody else wants to do, it's like anything else. So I had seen the adolescence and was a huge fan, but I never dreamed I had a chance because I thought that they'd be on, I don't even know what label, Slash or something but there is a song by uh eddie uh, sorry by the adolescents mm -hmm. and you eventually put it out that's why i'm bringing it up took me many moons do the eddie yep classic Absolute that was classic. their best song and yep. we just had like a fragment of it and then we were always trying to figure out that rhythm like do the eddie yeah. do the eddie do the eddie and then and then tony like switches up the rhythm i'm like how are you doing that <laughs> vocally and i studied like this like 30 second chunk of the song and I asked people about it. I asked the Black Flag guys. They they knew who Eddie was. Yeah. yeah. And and I never. I don't. I, I don't know if I ever met anyone in that band. And years later, you 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 release those demos, and now it's, it's because of you. I you have can listen to the whole the song. whole thing, and I was like, thank you. But the tragedy is, Tony only had the cassette of it. Like that's all that there was for the you right. know even for a demo. The Chaz Ramirez tapes. You know, everybody went to his house 20 times and asked his parents when he died and everything, and the tapes are just gone, so. Ah, and then I think you, I, and then you, I tried you state to, that I, on the record. You say this yeah. source is cassette. I went yeah. to every single one of Rodney's engineers and tried to see if they had a card or anything, and nobody had anything at all from those days, so. But it sounds okay. At yeah. least it's out there. Yeah, you know yeah at, least I mean? at least it's out there. there. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that for a second, because you say, you know, at least it's out there. There is so much of punk rock that it's it's a it's a bit of a highfalutin word but a bit of there's a lot of punk rock that's ephemeral in that if you weren't at the show that band broke up sorry you're never going to see them well I'll, I'll find their record they didn't make a record well i'll find the demo they didn't make a demo is there a live tape yeah my friend has it but oh i don't know he moved and all of a sudden the band is like erased from history yeah and every once in a while you do you know some digging and you find some like tape stash and you're like Aha, like you did with Tony's tape that we I can finally hear Do the yeah. Eddie in its entirety. And perhaps that is the only source of that song there is. Do you see yourself as a in any way a punk rock custodian or a curator? Well, let's talk about that then. Absolutely. Um, my number one job that, that I'm proud of myself is <clears throat> David Brown turning over the Danger House label to me. I mean, I don't own it or anything, but I just take care of it for him. So if somebody wants to license it for a movie or a TV show or, you know, I'll do all the vetting for him. But it's such an important label to L.A. and the records that they put out and the artwork and everything. So A really dangerous guy. <laughs> Black Randy. <laughs> yes. Uh, I bought the singles again from another coast all mm -hmm. the way to Washington. I slept in an arcade down at the laundromat, mm -hmm. loner with a boner. I mean, these songs <laughs> are just, as, they're just genius. Yeah. And you could tell by listening to the singer, Black Randy, like, this is a dangerous guy. He's like, he does not care. No. And it was kind of, those records, like Trouble at the Cup, these were songs that were kind of scary to me. I mean, like, this is wild. Like, these guys do not care. And, like, and it was funny that they were not really using guitars or anything. Like, that was part of the David Brown thing. They loved right. their, their keyboards. But I had a meeting with him as a video director. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even make a video. But when he came to town, he was making videos. I met him at his apartment. And then, I don't know, several months later, I was went to a Bomp In store. I worked at the Bomp store, but on Saturday, I didn't work. So he's in his full regalia of Black Randy with the feathered hats and the whole pimp thing. And he had just changed his whole deal. And But he was a maniac. He would do any prank to anybody. I don't know if you heard his phone calls online. He would record all the phone calls that came in. Amazing. Really, really bad. I'll, I'll point you to those someday. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I've heard them, but this, this sounds familiar. I think mm -hmm. I've heard about them. So he did a record called Pass the Dust, I Think I'm Bowie, which is one of those so album titles that lodges in the memory immediately. 
Like I, I've had that in my head for 36 or seven years or yep. so. Never quite understood what that meant, but just it so captivated me. Yep. And it was one of those, an original copy will run you some money. An original copy of almost any Danger House record will run you a lot of money. I think it's on your website. You can buy it from us for like <laughs> 10 bucks or you can right. buy it for 300. The that's, choice is yours. That's right. And so uh, what has it been like to be the, the, the person who's like keeping that, that label back in the world? I mean, I hope to reissue each single one by one standalone the way they are. Okay. Uh, Munster put them out as a box set. Right. But um, I've done two comps, the Black Randy, the SLA, but I need to get each single out, you know, exactly as it was so the paper feels the same and all that. But I'll get to that. And it's, there's not that many. It's very manageable because it was only around a couple of years. Yeah, so yeah. It's not, a it's, lot not, of it's not a huge yeah. catalog, no. but it's all worth hearing and yeah. it's all worth having, you know, the, yeah, the real vinyl. Yeah, there's not a dud. Even if you don't like the Howard Worth that much, it's still a great record. I yeah, mean, I, I if have you it. don't love it. Yeah. I have it because I'm a completist. So I exactly. have to have you it have all. Have it. Yeah. And it, it might be the least played of my Danger House titles, but it's still good to have it. Yeah. 1982, I'm on tour with Black Flag and we're in the East Village and me and Dukowski wander out of this diner we used to eat at all the time at like 2nd and 6th or something. Mm -hmm. And we're just waiting for the other guys to come out. We're just burning out on the sidewalk. Black Randy crosses the street. I'm just some fanboy. I'm like, oh, that's Black Randy. I, I, I recognized him. He was real, right. real skinny. Didn't look well. Sweating. He knows Dukowski from, you know, some, yeah. some past. And he and Dukowski kind of lock eyes. And he kind of looked at Dukowski like, and just kept walking. And he was just like sweating. He looked really rough. Like, didn't look good. And that was my only brush with Black Randy. He walked by me, and the rest of the day I was like, "What he's doing on the East Coast? How interesting!" Don't know. They didn't tour anything. It was and him, and yeah. maybe he was just out there visiting. And I said, "Was that Black Randy?" He goes, "Yeah." And Chuck and I was like, "Fanboy," because I, I have the records. I'm yeah. like, "Oh my God!" That's what he's just like, eh. he goes, "I guess he kind of knew him and didn't right, care right. or whatever." But that that was as close as I ever came. Let's talk about those days. And what LA was like, and and how, what music was doing to you in your life, and mm -hmm. what music, how music was informing all those people in those bands, the people at the show, speaking to the current of music, the velocity of it. Like when you're living for the music, when you're in the music scene, all your friends are freaks. Right. The straight world is like so distant. Even you're in it, but you're not a part of it. You're wandering through it. You're buying your food at Ralph's. But these people are space aliens, and all your friends discussed them as they discussed you. I mean, for me, it went, you know, I was hanging around the Runaways, as I mentioned, the Kim Fowley thing. I would yeah. tell my mom. And he was intense. Just go, yeah, he was, he was a real guy. piece of work, yeah. <laughs> but also helpful and not, not, not creepy or Mac guy to me anyway. But um, so I saw the Runaways a bunch. And then punk just sort of, you know, it sort of evolved, you know, the Patti Smith and the television. I saw the Ramones, and I cut school to see the Ramones. And... And then the L.A. punk scene, you know, you've heard it detailed many times, but just slowly, you know, Kim Fowley put on the punk night that had the deadbeats and various bands, saw the germs in some weird places. And these are all people that I used to see at shows waiting in line for Roxy Music, right. you know, sleeping overnight, you know, in front of the Santa Monica Civic. Like Keith also was another guy that I just saw. It. Uh, there was a teenage nightclub called The Odyssey. Anyway, so in the early punk shows, all I can say was, uh, it was pretty terrifying. I would go down to the Cuckoo's Nest because it was much more fun to see the bands down there. And there was a whole new scene than we had. And Andy Schwartz asked me to write a story about the hardcore scene, the OC hardcore scene that I did um, called The New Beaches. And then, you know, it just kind of went evolved from there. The Hong Kong Cafe. Madame Wong's a total joke. They, you know, had a couple shows. I don't know why they ever got any credit for anything. But. Right. Because so, the reason I ask is mm -hmm. because the Arena Rock... It kept it. You could be a fan of Peter Frampton, and I am, or mm -hmm. all these bands. I have all those records. Yeah. I, I love them dearly. You're never going to meet any of these people, mm -hmm. and you're never going to get that close to the stage, and you're never going to really feel rock and roll in the cheap seats. I always had Aerosmith tickets a mile yeah. away from yeah, the yeah, band. Yeah, they were yeah. always this big, binoculars. And like the after effects of sound, like the mm -hmm. song gets to you a verse later, all broken to pieces yeah, from yeah. ricocheting around the hockey rink. Punk rock allows you to be right up close, the guy sweats on you, you can pick up the set list after the show, you can help the bass player take his rig back to his car trunk, and all of a sudden music is real. Yeah. You're feeling it, it leaks on you, the guy falls on you, Lux yeah. Interior, you're like, ah, sweaty man. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden music is so real, where it becomes part of your life, 
And that was the thing that happened to me. And, and it, it was the most profound thing in my young life, going from arena rock, which was cool, saw Led yeah. Zeppelin, Nugent, it was all good, to standing right in front of Joe Strummer. You know, yeah, Clash exactly. opening with but with uh, Clash with Bo Diddley opening Feb 15, 1979, Washington D.C. Uh, looking up at you know Lux Interior or watching Brian Gregory spit the cigarette across the club with all seventy five of us in the room. Right. Where you re walking out of there, you realized my life has changed. Nothing's ever going to be the same. I don't think the same way about things. I'm a music person. And somehow I'm going to have a connection to music for the rest of my life. I'll work at a label, I'll buy records, I'll be in a band, but I got music in me now where my ELO records, as much as I love them. I love ELO. I know, but it never love made them. me think yeah. music's in me. It's just a thing I bought and kind of listened right. to. But when I had, you know, the Cramps, the Weirdos, X, all these bands, this was my music. That was the insignia on my shield, and I waded into the into battle. That's exactly how I feel about it too. I never considered having a career. I'll go be an accountant, or I'll go to college, or something. It was like I know I'm going to be involved in music, and that's all I'm going to do. And I'm and I'm not going to grow out of it. Or it's like you know, then you know, at some point you just grow up and you don't like music anymore. It's like I still go see bands all the time. Yeah. I don't really work with new bands anymore, but it's much better for my psyche to just put out old records. But. Okay. But um, never considered, you know, total career change or anything. You and I have been buying records since we were very young. We buy records to this day. And so there's no resurgence in vinyl for us. There's just an uptick in vinyl sales, which is cool for all independent labels and record store day. And I, I love all of it. And I, I, I like the colored vinyl. I just, I, it's just such a celebration of music. And some of it's gimmicky and it gets into collector boy things. But that's all okay with me as long as, it, as ultimately you're getting the damn record on the turntable and getting the speakers moving. And so for Frontier Records, how has this new interest in vinyl affected your label, if at all? It's been really great. We went from, I mean, first of all, I never stopped making vinyl, even right. when people were all, all about CDs and, oh, I'm going to sell all my records and only buy CDs, and everybody loved making the money from that. So now they're throwing away all their CDs and buying all the albums yeah. all over again, which is great. But mostly they just they appreciate what it is, which is much better sound. If something is made of that era, I don't think any digital remastering is going to make it sound the way that it should have made. Right. Even even though my records are made for a shoestring, they still sound way better on vinyl. But it's great to have people interested in it again. The, the graphics are better. Who, want, who who can even remember a CD cover? You know, it's right. just too little. You know, where I spend a lot of time thinking about my record covers, and I want people to see the full thing. But um, so yeah, record stores day is great. It's a it's a great thing for everybody, and and I hope that uh, I hope it's not a fad. That's that's what I'm worried about. I've, I hope it's not a fad. Not, I don't know. I'm not. I don't think it's a fad. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a bubble. I just think it's the beginning of a really great conversation, and I just think it's going to get better and better as we go. And right. maybe that's that's just my want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or naivete. But I it's just too good to be. But either a way, I'm not going to stop making records. Like even if they go yeah. back to you know it's 70 30 or whatever. Right now, vinyl like you can't give CDs away, which is nice. Yeah, that's a great thing. But uh, you know, it may flip around 50 50 again. It may do any combination of stuff. But I'll never put vinyl out of print ever. Are there any other labels like Danger House mm -hmm. that you would like to acquire so you can bring them the records back to life? Gosh, I can't think of a whole thing where I liked all the tape. I mean, obviously there was labels where everything they put out was great, like Touch and Go, but yeah. obviously those people are big and they don't need me. Right. But I can't think of a thing. If you have any suggestions, uh, right. but or how about <laughs> yeah. uh, a single record or a single, like a real, it, like a, a a record that's out of print that maybe the band released themselves and you want to. I don't know if it's in print or not, but I, you know, Agent Orange should have been on Frontier. I would love to put out Living in Darkness. That would have been uh, a really good it should Frontier have been record on my label. Totally, so there's I a totally lot of things agree. like. That. Yeah, exactly. So, so I'm posh and there's right? some New York, yeah, there's some New York stuff like the stimulators. There's a lot of things that I would like to put out, either reissue the single itself or put a comp together, and just sort of hasn't happened. But as far as as playback uh, at your place, when you're not listening critically for mastering or whatever, when you're just listening because you like to put a record on, when's your favorite time to listen? 
do you do you have a listening partner is listening a solo pursuit uh what's your stereo situation like as far as like speakers uh where is it located how often do you play records Any i actually of that? have a record room where all my records are in all right but i finally did the grown-up thing which is you know they can be funneled into any room so you can play it in the living room or the bedroom or whatever so you can wash dishes because it used to be like i just have to listen to records in this room you know so it's depressing but um so now i can crank them into any room is it a solo person it just depends on who's around you know if my employees there we probably we have diametrically opposite tastes so i don't torment her with stuff so i would say generally it's a probably listen on my own the most okay and yeah. So you, what, you have the speakers in the ceiling and you, the music pipes through from one it's source? It actually goes under the house. Yeah, the speakers are in, are in you know, like the living room, the record yeah. room. Uh, I have a set in, the, in the, uh, my bedroom. And so you can just, uh, t you know, turn the stations, which I'm still having trouble with. But anyway, it has a little thing and you change the stations around. And, uh, but and, it, it, and it, it goes, you know, and it goes into whatever room. It sends it into whatever room you're in. Is there a stereo system, like not in the ceiling, like two speakers just regular old speakers yeah. yeah it's not fancy at all it's just like two clips giant ass speakers ah, so horn driven that. okay yeah yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a different sound those clips um and and so uh, in your listening environment do you ever just like sit down with some records and go like tonight i'm doing this and just like get into a serious listening session do you grab some records and like i'm not doing anything i'm not putting the tv on i'm not oh, cooking yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, i'm yeah. just sitting and listening and so yeah. you do that that's great to know because I can't concentrate on it if I'm doing any work or on the computer or anything. I can't concentrate on music at all. It's just like white noise. It might as well. I might as well have the TV set on. Right. So I just have to make myself just listen to records. As far as uh, you said, you're buying new music. Mm -hmm. This makes me very happy. Um, what are you listening to that's new? Gosh, there's so many bands, and you're going to ask me that. There's a band that's the called thing. Morgan. There's so, there's so many good bands. There's so right many now. new bands, and it's crazy. I love Morgan Delt. I love the Meat Bodies. Oh, they're so oh, good. Oh my God, they're, they're so amazing. Good. I love Wand. I love Wand. Uh, yes. You're killing you me. Too, I love yeah. these records. Yeah, yeah, I go to the Echo all the time. I love Sheer Mag. I'm going to see them next week. Um, old favorites, Mark Eitzel. I'm going to see him on Sunday at some backyard thing. So it's like, it's all over the place. But, it, you know, there's so many new bands that are incredible. So you're paying attention them. to the Castle Face label in the red. Uh, that, that's the kind guys of... that do Broncho? Schizophonics, have you seen them? Uh -uh. Yet? Amazing, totally rocking, like unbelievably rocking. The guy plays guitar, does the splits like 100 times per song, like unbelievable. You have to, they play here a lot and they're super huh. good. They're on a label called Pig Baby. Okay. And um, yeah, there's always something new. It's like never, it never fails. When you hear when people are like, oh, music was better when I was young, I go, man, you're turning into your dad. Yeah, that is It'll a never terrible happen to thing me. to say. Like, there will never, you know, there's a lot of bad bands too, guys. There's, but there's, there's always been bad bands. There's always been bad bands, but there's more now than ever, and they're harder to, you know, seek out. But, you know, if you regularly go to the Echo or pay attention or. Yeah, just go to the know. record store, go yeah. online, explore, listen to my radio show. Yes. There yeah, you there's go. always good people going, like, look, you got to hear this. Trust me, I'm not going to waste your time. Yeah. And, and I listen to other people's radio shows and podcasts. I and have a whole streaming radio station that people can listen to. You do? Whenever they like. Yeah, it's called KXFU. KXFU. And it's just all over the place. Yeah, it's just all over. So you're I play lounge music. I play country. I play 78s. I play punk rock. Yeah, it's just... KXFU. Yeah, oh. it's just like, just mix it all together. You don't have to play the punk block or this or whatever. It's just, you know, I was inspired by you and everybody else was like, you don't have to play a certain kind of music. Right. So in all these years of being a music fan, going to the shows, having a record label and all of that, you have never lost your enthusiasm for music. If anything, it's getting more intense. Absolutely. Like uh -huh. if I could go out every, if I had the stamina to go out every night, yeah. I would. But I just can't. I have other things I have to do. But, but if you would, you could. I would absolutely. And, and so, I could. And I could. Had I the time and the resources, I would go out every night. There's a band to see every single night. And and so you are the opposite of burning out. Oh no, no chance of that. Not unless I go deaf, and then I don't know what I'll do. I hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah.